uh, we have Michael Hill from BCG and uh, just to let you know we all of you will be muted so Mike uh, why don't you please go ahead and introduce yourself to the group uh, touching a bit about your previous background MBA and the life after that yeah sure so uh, Michael He, I am currently at BCG. I've been here for about two years. Um, I actually hit my 10 years out of uh, MBA about a week ago. And it's a very funny thing to see on your Facebook when you look at what you wrote on Facebook 10 years ago and how you feel about today. So it well, really makes you think and go back. Um, my, I was actually a 3-2 student in, uh, at Rochester. So when I graduated three years, I got my MBA in corporate finance and accounting two years after that. Um, so I really started working in 07, um, and from, from there I actually worked at Citigroup, at Travelers, and Liberty Mutual. I did various roles, but that's usually either in from a financial reporting analytics perspective or a product analytics role. Um, and then that kind of experience, learning kind of the technical uh, side, knowing the financial side of the business, um, and kind of building up leadership skills is how I got to where I am today. So, why don't you tell us a bit more about your time at Simon? I know you and I have talked about it previously, um, but just to kind of explain that process for you. I know you went through quite a lot of changes, so. Yeah, so uh, for me, Simon was, was actually really interesting. Um, you know, like I said, I was 3-2, so my undergraduate was computer science and economics. Um, and frankly, undergraduate, uh, for me, the classes were not that hard. And frankly, when I was graduating, I was looking for a challenge. And so I got to MBA. That was my true first challenge. And that challenge was, was really what got me thinking about analytics. It, those were the classes that really got me. When I looked at, like, when we're doing FSA, I think you guys still have FSA today. Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff was really interesting, really. Be able to take numbers and truly build a story out of it. And then once you have that story, to be able to execute something. In FSA, it was about execution of, say, maybe buying a stock or shorting your stock. But, you know, in the real world, it's also just making a decision, deciding to buy a, a product that, you know, for the company or to acquire something. You know, that, that idea that you could just take what everyone else can see, but with a little bit of knowledge, mm -hmm. you could um, really uh, create a business. Uh, you can really have a business idea from it. That was pretty amazing to me. Mm -hmm. um, while I was there, you know, I joined a bunch of various groups, and frankly, you know, that's really what MBA is about. There's probably 20-30% where you're really learning the education, mm -hmm. but the rest of the time is spending time networking with people. Uh, there are plenty of people from my year, the year before mine, and the year after mine that I keep in contact with today. Mm -hmm. and frankly, that's a huge value of going to any B school, and especially at Simon. Mm -hmm. So, you just spoke about the value of building that network. So on average, among the academic craziness, how much time did you spend on networking? And how did you really go about finding those people you wanted to network with? Um, so that makes it pretty easy, honestly. Um, I would say my first quarter, I really focused a lot on the work because the work was new and difficult. But frankly, you get a lot of that network from just uh, working with your study groups that you, that you form, um, mm -hmm. working with the groups that are kind of created in class, and then obviously going to the, and I think they still must have this now, the bi-weekly kind of going to a bar and hanging out there and doing some extracurricular activities on the side. Mm -hmm. And those are all the different pieces of, of really getting to know people. And frankly, that's just a, a general networking thing, right, which is mm -hmm. you meet people based on very similar goals or similar thought processes or, you know, a similar type of job and then kind of create that personal connection that way. Mm -hmm. So talking a bit more about that, how would you differentiate uh, meeting someone in person while you're networking versus reaching out to them over LinkedIn, emails, phone calls. What's your take on that? Yeah, so well, when you're just starting out, you, there's this desire to have a separation in your life between personal and business. And that makes a lot of sense because you've kind of done that all of your life. You've done, hey, this is what I do at school, this is what I do for personal life, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are certain types of careers where that's not really realistic. Mm -hmm. um, not really realistic because one, it takes up a lot of your time, mm -hmm. and two, because it kind of requires you to have that ability outside of just those two very differentiated spheres. Mm -hmm. And and so, careers that have that a lot are oftentimes in consulting and banking because they're very heavy relationship mm -hmm. pieces. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so you kind of have to recognize that, hey, or I said, you know, one of my good friends actually from Simon actually said to me, you know, he's like, I'm going to be a consultant my entire life. Mm -hmm. I have a choice. I can either become friends with the people I'm going to be consulting with, sure. or I can not know them at all and just really hate my life <laughs> going to these people, right? And those are kind of the trade-offs. Right. And you can find people that, that will work with you, that you want to work with, that also happen to be good clients. Mm -hmm. That's the plus, right? And that's the way you have to think about it, that networking isn't just about finding the job. It's about making this connection so that in the future you guys might have a conversation and go, oh my God, like you and I are working on very similar things when we share ideas. Or mm -hmm. hey, you might have a job opportunity for me or I might have one for you. Mm -hmm. Or just here, here's some general knowledge I know that we can trade off and just discuss. I mean, these kind of things happen all the time. Right. And, and that's kind of what is natural behind the networking piece. Sure. So you mentioned briefly about that Simon makes it easy for you to go through that process. So in your time, what sort of resources did you leverage from the CMC on and on your own? So CMC gave me some very interesting things. Um, they gave me some resumes of, of you know people who came before me. Mm -hmm. um, one of the more interesting things I, I got to do was to reach out to Mike Ryan. I, I actually don't know where he is now, but okay. he was the uh, head of wealth management at UBS. Hmm. Right. And, and just his that note, like we have a few MSN first year MBAs on the line, um, what advice would you give to them specifically while they're in their internship search? And then probably even if we can talk a bit about full-time jobs. Yeah, so MS is always a little more difficult, right, because first you have to explain to people what the difference between MS and MBA is. And so rather than going down that rabbit hole, I think it's important to tell people, you know, immediately what your interests are and, and what you're really you know, seeking and, and what you feel like are the skill sets you're bringing, right? Mm -hmm. the, job, the, the value of the MS is is really giving you that technical skill set mm -hmm. and giving you that certification that says, hey, like I really know how to do this. Mm -hmm. so that's how you have to think about like, your branding piece. That's what you're that's what you're really selling that I am I am this person of this technical sphere sure. that I'm getting my MS in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Yes, but the only difference in MBAs is that MBAs are kind of given that ability to be a little bit more generalist, right? Mm -hmm. MBAs are saying, okay, I, I have collected all this various knowledge about running a business mm -hmm. and in this job that I'm interviewing for, I can take this stuff, focus it into this narrow sphere. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of just that difference between two degrees, it's still really the same thing, which is being able to sell what your skill sets are mm -hmm. and be able to get to exactly why this person actually, you know, what you bring to the table for this person. Sure. Um, before I, I know you have a very interesting career path, and before I talk to you about your path after Simon, um, if you can share us a little bit more about your story as to how did you go about your internship and full-time search during Simon. So uh, I, I think when I tell my story, people will actually enjoy it because um, I'll be honest, when I started my inter my first internship, I really didn't know what I was doing. Hmm. Um, and I think that's probably a story many people have. Uh, you get thrown into this crazy world where there's probably, I would say, the top 10 to 20% of the class mm -hmm. really have an idea what they're going to do in two years. Right. And the rest of the people kind of come in and have an idea of how it will help them, but no idea of how to go from A to B. Right. There's no connection between them. And, and that was my path as well. Um, thankfully, I, I had a couple of good friends who helped me network into an interesting internship. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the internship, and frankly, the, the key is any business internship is probably, uh, it, any business internship will be helpful because that will help you start utilizing some of the skills you picked up in school mm -hmm. and start thinking about, okay, I like this, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. That's what it did for me. Um, 
my first internship uh, was actually working in more of a kind of a, a local tech. Uh, they weren't a startup at that point. They're, they're more like four or five years in. Mm -hmm. But just going in there and you know, working with them and doing some market analysis was really interesting just to kind of see what's going on. Mm -hmm. What I learned from that is I love that environment. I did not want to do market analysis. Right. But that's a huge deal. Just learning what you don't like is actually really good because then it helps you start focusing on what you want to do. And frankly, my career has been a lot of figuring out what it is that I really want to do. Mm -hmm. So I started off and I thought I really wanted to work at a bank. And so that's why you know, I interviewed with Citibank um, or Citigroup. And I went to their, uh, actually, so I interviewed with, with them for their actually more undergraduate uh, FMA stuff. They said that, you know, I wasn't the right fit for what they're they're looking for and actually told me, hey, keep in contact. You might have something else. Mm -hmm. I actually did that. Um, so uh, a month later, I reached out and said, hey, you remember you told me to keep in contact? <laughs> so I did. And they neither came back and said, perfect, we actually have a job for you. Would you nice. like to come in? <laughs> and I was like, that's amazing. I did not think that would actually work out. <laughs> right. uh, and it happened to be that the Sulon portfolio, uh, uh, sorry, their Sulon portfolio group was actually looking for a mm -hmm. portfolio analyst. Mm -hmm. and so I went in, interviewed, and it actually you know went through and it was actually like the most amazing simple job process. Um, that's kind of how I fell into that first job. Mm -hmm. I was just being persistent. I didn't, I didn't, you know, that's not something like was on my list. I didn't say I want to be at portfolio loans. It happened to be that I knew the type of job, meaning I wanted to do some sort of analytics. I wanted to be at a bank, and mm -hmm. I was persistent. That's really how I got there. And then working there for a while, I realized, you know, what I really wanted was more of a career mm -hmm. So I actually went back to, uh, and so I had other interviews and stuff, and one of those places was actually with Travelers Insurance. Mm -hmm. So I actually went back to them and said, hey, like, I actually think that you know, this rotation program is better for me. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, it really was. It gave me a sense for looking through, I, I had three different rotations. Um, one was to look at sales incentives for, uh, for agents who are selling uh, personal insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, one role was actually reinsurance, which was really interesting because I happened to be um, there right when the whole bank, uh, when all the stocks went down for banks, and that whole crazy time um, in 08, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, reinsurance is all about looking at uh, uh, basically any asset that banks were holding that we were, that we needed to, oh, sorry, this is too much. Also, it was about looking at how, you know, how the banks were doing and the health of the banks. So right. every day on my drive-in, I would listen to the news, and that day, I would be doing analysis of that bank right. for travelers. And that was a very interesting job. And the last one I actually did more kind of helping uh, execs prep for quarterly uh, financial, for the quarterly financial calls. Mm -hmm. So just a totally different job. But you know, through those three things, I really realized the underlying theme was I really knew how to do Excel and Access. Right. I just really loved doing analytics because it got people to do, it got people to decision points mm -hmm. that were based on real data. Mm -hmm. right? And I actually liked interacting with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And those are points that I, you know, it helped me start to narrow down exactly the jobs I wanted to do and what mm -hmm. I did want to do. Hmm. Interesting. So, I know you uh, mentioned earlier and on the call as well that you started with a career more than like finance and then switching to analytics. Mm -hmm. um, while going through that process, um, did you face any challenges, any questions? Like, okay, you're kind of a career switcher and how did you go about that? Um, it's funny, and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say this even though I'm not that old, this is, an age, this is an issue of age. Okay. And when I say this is an issue of age, what I mean is, 10 years ago when we were graduating from, from uh, when I was graduating from Simon, mm. um, there was not a analytics job. Right. And people who did analysis were, were, were analysts. Mm -hmm. We never said there's an analytics group versus a reporting group versus something else. It was all part of that DNA, right? Financial planning and analysis. Because of big data, because of the rise in programming, all these other things, that's how you started having a completely different analytics group um, outside of just regular financial reporting. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of people, especially people that graduated from the same time I did, if you went through the corporate finance route, mm -hmm. oftentimes people found themselves slowly becoming and part of an analytics group, and that's just how the world works. So for me, it happened to be it worked very well that that you know it's the transition because of how it works in, in the business world mm -hmm. that was very normal. Today, I agree. There is now a completely different finance and analysis world. Okay. Um, hmm. So 
for um, we also spoke briefly about that he said okay the top 20% probably know what they like, really want okay I want to be an investment banker I want to be a financial analyst but for others who and especially like me uh, who are still like okay I have a sense of what I want what industry do I want to be in but not really in terms of a role um, sometimes what can that do to you is you come across as all over the place when you're reaching out to someone so yeah. how what advice would you give to someone like that I think you need to be upfront and say that because I would think that I would tell you that most people who will take that call from you will have felt that at some point in their life maybe not right out of the MBA maybe it was in undergrad mm -hmm. right maybe it was some other point but everyone's been at a point where they said okay I really don't know what it is I want to do mm -hmm. here's some things I like and some things I don't like and remember that's part of the networking call too mm -hmm. not all networking calls are about finding the job. Some of them can just be for pure mentorship. Mm. Right? And there's plenty of alumni that's willing to give that mentorship and there's plenty of alumni that had to get that mentorship in order to get their jobs. Right. And that's one thing to keep in mind. Right. Um, you spoke about your internship being at a smaller company um, mm -hmm. which advocates that yes a program hiring is good you can get convert the offer to a full time but in your case you didn't have that option and you went the other route. So if yes. you can talk a bit more about your job search process in the second year coming off that internship what did you leverage out of that and how did you go about pitching yourself to your full-time employers so let's start with the idea that um, like dating uh, finding a job is a, is a numbers game right. uh, if you know just one person you want to date you know just one company you want to work at it's going to be very difficult hmm. right because you have to make sure you're perfect for that one company mm -hmm. So the first thing is just to remember that you should you should find a couple of targets, mm -hmm. not just have one. I mean, for me, I think about that point. There's a couple of things I had to get ready for. One, I had to get a resume that made sense. Mm -hmm. uh, two, I had to actually learn how to truly interview. Mm -hmm. And three, I had to actually be okay with being told no a lot and still be uh, still be able to go to the next interview. Mm -hmm. um, I remember so I. I went from, I was, so second year, I went from November to February. Mm -hmm. well, actually, November to January, no interviews at all. January to February, a bunch of interviews and all no's. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in like end of February, early March, I really figured out how to do things. Mm -hmm. And basically three weeks after that, I got five job offers. Oh, wow. Uh, my job offers were from U, from Travelers, from City, from uh, UBS, I can't remember the others, but like I just, it just, every day just happened to click. Right. And, and so I would tell you that, you know, my experience is if you're not getting calls back, it's probably because there's something that, that's happening at each of those places are very similar. It's not that you're not getting to how to be up. It's not that you haven't figured out how to answer the question at that company. Mm -hmm. It's that there's something generally fundamentally that you need to figure out. Because okay. once you do that, everyone can see that, like, you're ready to take that job. Sure. So from your your experience, what changed in that January to February and then post February timeline? What did you what what was it for you that was probably stopping you from getting those interviews? For me, it was focusing down to the time you know looking at corporate finance. It was able to articulate to people why I wanted to do corporate finance. Hmm. Um, and remember, corporate finance is still a very broad topic, right? But there are still some very basic things about that, which meant I like to be in data. I want to be able to tell you a story. I wanted to be able to create a presentation, mm -hmm. uh, and then I had strong, you know, financial technical skills. Like mm -hmm. those are things that I had to figure a way to tell you mm -hmm. without just saying, "Oh, I know Excel, therefore you should think that I know the technical skill." Right? I had to create mm -hmm. a, a way to tell you I knew it without just rattling off lists of software or lists of functions I knew. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so let's let's talk a bit more about your experience at BCG um, because you joined the analytics group specifically here. Um, so how different or similar was it working in your previous roles? As you mentioned that those final those financial positions kind of converge into an analytics role. Sure. So let's start with with the difference between uh, internal finance and consulting. Mm -hmm. Great. And the biggest problem, the biggest difference between internal finance and consulting. I think comes out of two basic things. One, when you're in, when you're internal, you may not see your CFO, your CEO, your you know senior vice president who wants your data more often than say every three four months. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So you've got time to prepare. Mm -hmm. In consulting, that is your client. So mm -hmm. you're going to see them twice a week. So you better have something new to show them you know, twice a week. And that, that itself is a pretty, pretty difficult pressure. Uh, the other piece that's very different is just the work-life balance changes completely, mm -hmm. right? You know, you and I have talked about this. I think it's important for everyone else to hear this. You're interested in consulting. It almost always tends to be that you're traveling 80% or mm -hmm. more. So typical for most of the uh, for most of MBB, and 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 since you're Deloitte, you know, for those those less than they're probably already in DC. You're traveling to a client site Monday to Thursday, and mm -hmm. then you have Friday where you're either home or, like I am, I'm actually in the office. Mm -hmm. um, and that's your really only day that you kind of have time to like be part of your company. Right. The rest of the time, you're building relationships at the client site, both with your clients mm -hmm. and your case team, who you will have probably never met before. Right. And you guys will have to learn how to work together and become a cohesive team mm -hmm. and create an amazing product, usually in anywhere between four to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's very fast. Mm -hmm. So. Um, for a, a question specifically uh, to answer for people who are interested in analytics, um, what sort of tools and technologies and concepts uh, would you advise them to focus on based on yeah. how the industry is functioning right now? Let's separate analytics into two things I often think about, which is there's the programming engineering side mm -hmm. and there's the solving business questions side. Okay. Right? If you're interested in truly doing the programming engineering side, don't go after analytics. Become a software engineer. You're much mm -hmm. better off from a career progression and from a compensation perspective to go do that. Right. If, however, you're interested in the business decision, then you should stay in analytics. And if you're curious about business decisions, what you should think about is it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just like you learn, um, you, know, you learn how to read financial statements mm -hmm. by looking by learning accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, just like you learn, you know, some basic functions in Excel. Mm -hmm. In the future, those things will change. Mm -hmm. What won't change is your ability to think through problems. Right. I think that is, everything else is just a tool that happens to be a tool today. Mm -hmm. so, so, even in the last year, I've had to pick up three new tools because that's just how the industry has changed. We now have three new tools. Mm -hmm. In a year from now, it'd be three totally different tools. So there. Are, I don't want to tell people to look at tools because that's just what's popular today. It's right. like telling you, you know, what's the right thing to dress to work today. <laughs> that's not going to be the case. What matters is you have to understand logic very well, programming logic very well. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to distill a business question mm -hmm. down to a smaller piece so you can solve that piece. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to understand well how data is actually collected. Mm -hmm. Because if you start with bad data and you try to do analysis of bad data, you're going to have a bad answer. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, so you briefly spoke about the uh, the culture of the consulting industry. Um, I know you have an interesting fun fact, and uh, if you could speak a bit more about the culture at BCG, and how sure. do you find it different from other consulting firms? Yep. So because consulting requires everyone to come together, break apart, and come together hmm. all the time, there's a higher focus on making sure you fit the corporate culture. Because mm -hmm. that just makes it easier for everyone to come together and work together. Mm -hmm. um, so the fun fact I have given is that you know I tend to be more of an E, and everyone else happens to be an I, mm -hmm. right? But definitely at, at BCG, the the two things that that happen I think 99% of the time is that in the Myers Briggs, everyone is a TJ. Right. Um, um, but, what, but what matters there is that every company is a little different. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to speak to the culture of other companies. It's something that you know you should talk to other people who are there. We mm -hmm. know them all. But at BCG, you should think of us as the the probably the nerdiest consulting group. Mm -hmm. Hence why everyone here almost always is INTJ. People here really are truly actively curious, mm -hmm. and that's why they tend to be hired because you show that you not only spend a lot of time thinking about problems for mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. You also show that you're okay going, hey, I don't know that, but I want to learn it, and I want to learn it very fast. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the people that we're looking for here. Right. So, um, you know that you switched a couple of ships before landing up at BCG. Um, mm -hmm. What advice would you give someone from Simon if they are looking to get into, say, a job at BCG? Um, is it hard? I know BCG is a top consulting firm. Does it look at core schools? What should they do if they want to work at BCG? So, 
analytics is the best way to get into consulting right now because mm -hmm. it is a difficult skill set to find mm -hmm. and it is actually the most sought after skill set right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the reasons I think I'm very lucky to happen to have that skill set to be able to get in. Right. Um, but, but I think I leave the analytics piece aside, there's still some general things that everyone should really think about, which is you're not here to do the code. Like mm -hmm. that's how you get your work done, mm -hmm. but no one's getting hired to do the code. Mm -hmm. What you're really being hired to do is come in and be able to distill that business question. Mm -hmm. Right? There's just like generalists go in and they go, okay, here's here's a problem you have. Okay, all right, I think I can solve it this way, and they go off and do it in Excel. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what you're doing in analytics. You go in and go, oh, that's a problem. I can solve that with R. Mm -hmm. But R is not the value you're selling. It's the okay. Well, how do I solve it in R? That's the that is the that's, value. That's more important, right? Yeah. True. Um, so um, I'll probably stick to the PCG question again. Um, if um, most of us on the set, on the call right now are international students, and H1B sponsorship is a big factor. Um, even if you have a job offer, might not make through the lottery at the end of the first year. Uh, the OPT extension that we get. So, for a big firm like BCG, how do they handle hiring? Like for someone international, are they open to move, relocate them, or expose them to international opportunities or home country? How does that really? So, work? so if you allow us, we will find a way to. Keep I think that's really the easiest way to, to say that. Right. Um, we have operations globally. Mm. We are actually expanding dramatically in Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, right now, our largest uh, presence in analytics is in North America. Mm -hmm. And actually that works out well for everyone who's international because that means the rest of the world, we haven't started building our groups yet. Right. So we're looking to build our groups in those places. Mm -hmm. um, typically, you know, we do sponsor a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and frankly, in consulting, it's actually very easy to explain why we need that expert, which is that, hey, mm -hmm. like, you really cannot find this expert elsewhere. Right. That said, that's also the reason why when I talk to people about this, I always say, I actually don't care about how good you are at analytics. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's, even though it's something that's hard to find, for everybody applying, everyone already has that. Mm -hmm. what, you, what we're looking for is, okay, if I sit you down next to our client, Mm -hmm. Can you explain to them in, in business terms what you're doing in R and Python and Tableau, mm -hmm. right? Not that, oh, okay, I write this function and I call this package, or in Tableau, you know, I can create you an awesome workbook, but what does this workbook really tell me? Right. Right. That, that conversation piece is what takes you from being just an analytics person mm -hmm. to an analytics consultant. Nice. So what sort of practice routine would you recommend someone to go through? to be able to come to that level, what you just said. So every consulting company has case interview prep on mm -hmm. their website. Mm -hmm. um, not that you should memorize this like verbatim, but what you, should, what you should do is go look at it and think through, you know, what is the thinking process we're trying to get you to. Mm -hmm. So BCG is very much a hypothesis-based company. So what happens is you tell us, here's your business question. Mm -hmm. We actually generate anywhere between 10 to 15 different hypotheses that we think could be the reason causing it. Mm -hmm. And then we go and break up the team into different people and everybody takes one or two hypotheses and tries to figure out mm -hmm. the data, the, you know, the analysis we can perform to either say, yep, that's a true hypothesis or that's a false hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And once we go through those lists, then we go, okay, here's the things that we found out was actually true. Mm -hmm. Okay, now how do we solve for this true issue? Mm -hmm. Right, and then we keep generating these hypotheses until we find, right, to the end, until we get to the end where we go, okay, right. So a good example of this, okay. So for instance, um, you're a paper company, mm -hmm. and last year you had 10% growth. This year you have minus 20% growth. Mm -hmm. What happened? Mm -hmm. Right. So typically in a case interview, someone will just go, hey, tell me what happened, mm -hmm. and you give us, you know, three or four hypotheses you want to track down. Mm -hmm. uh, usually using some sort of business framework, you might go, okay. Uh, you have new competitors coming in. Do you have a different marketing scheme? Does your product immediately change, or have you know have there been huge turnover in your sales department? Mm -hmm. you know, and then we would go, okay, number one, two, and three. Those are issues. What would you do to solve for those issues? And then you keep going through that. And so none of that has required analytics yet, right? But mm -hmm. it's just the difference of that. Hey, um, if one of these questions results in okay, we can answer this, but we have a 100 gigabyte data file that we need to analyze. Mm -hmm. That's when the analytics consultant is useful and the 
you know, the journalist consultants, not as useful. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So, um, you spoke about your experience at Travelers and Citigroup and now BCG. Um, we understand that hiring might work differently at different companies. And then a big question people have while applying online is that those systems are probably designed to more filter you out versus to let you in. Um, so what is the ideal job search process for someone who's uh, international, for someone who's not from a core school? Yes. Even if you're from a core school, this is still the ideal job process, which is you definitely should reach out to some alumni in the company. Mm -hmm. um, especially for companies, in, you know, especially for most consulting companies, especially in the MBBs, we don't ever need to go to our online profiles. Okay. We have so many people to go through from referrals that mm -hmm. we never have to get there. Right? Mm -hmm. I was just looking at statistics yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, for every job opening we have, we have about sixty people who apply. Oh. Right. Mm -hmm. So, if you think about it, we'll go through our you know in person referrals first. If we don't find anybody, mm -hmm. then we'll go to our external recruiters. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go to our online. Mm -hmm. Right. So. You have to go through a lot of people before your online profile is picked up. Mm -hmm. If you just go through them, right. So a question that people usually face is, okay, how long before should I wait to ask someone to refer me to a job? Um, what's your take on that relationship building versus asking someone for a favor or a help? Uh, to be honest with you, my approach has always been if I talk to you and I feel like you're going to make it through, mm -hmm. I would ask you for a resume and try to into the system, hmm. right? Um, uh, this is one of those very difficult things for alumni, which is while we want to be very helpful, mm -hmm. uh, we also want to be very realistic, right? Mm -hmm. That if you think that you, know, you don't have what it takes to pass the first round, mm -hmm. you kind of don't want to because what happens is if you start referring people and they often don't make it to the first round, mm -hmm. HR starts ignoring you, mm -hmm. right? They just go, oh, you just give us everybody. We just, you know, you're not a useful refer, like a reference. Right. So that happens, right? And so that's that's always a trade-off, at least in my head, hmm. that we'll be talking about that. Cool. Um, for people who have slightly more experience, so I'm going to talk about two brackets. If you're less than three years or more than three years, or around five years, um, would you have any specific advice for the process for them to follow? Should they reach out right now? Should they wait for more like the March-April timeline? Um, how does that usually work? In your well, if, you're, if you're looking for a full-time job in the summer, hmm. you should never wait. Okay. <laughs> you should be searching for a job always. Um, the only difference when it comes, if you think about analytics and consulting, uh, when it comes to experience, mm -hmm. is relevant experience. If you say, for instance, you had 10 years as a chemical engineer, mm -hmm. and now you want to start you know, doing analysis, I'd say maybe two or three of those might be relevant. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, say you're, you know, you've been an accountant the whole time, and now you want to switch. You may not have any years of relevant experience, right. right? And that's really where the difficulty is. To give you a sense, in our analytics team, mm -hmm. the analyst level, meaning your entry level ball, mm -hmm. typically people have worked between one and three years in an actual analytics, mm -hmm. like focused a role. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so walking into that full time job, say you have the offer, you're starting your career. Um, what what was your process plus what advice would you give for people to ensure that they have a good career progression? What are some do's and don'ts um, for that? So I saw a question earlier. People asked about the 30, 60, 90 day plan. Yeah. That's a very good plan to have mm -hmm. uh, coming in. Uh, building your relationships and network is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, you should definitely work on that. And always sure that you're keeping ahead of where the technology is. You want to be the guy bringing technology into the company. You don't want to be the guy sitting in the classroom learning the technology. Hmm. And sorry, I, I said guy, but <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so for consulting folks and analytic folks, uh, I know you mentioned about the case prep method. Um, are there any specific online resources or books or videos or websites would you recommend them to move through to start kind of getting familiar with the consulting interview and the career? Yep, so Vault.com has a great consulting guide, just like it has a great iBanking guide. Um, Can you see that name again? You should also, uh, 
the vault.com. Vault.com, okay. V A U L T. Yep. Yep. Um, and frankly, like I said, every major consulting company's website in their career section will walk you through their uh, case methodology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how did you go about practicing your behavioral interviews while you were at school? And possibly even after while switching jobs? Uh, you find some good friends who won't laugh at you when, you, when you're not telling you the good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then you talk to CMC who, who is very useful for getting some pretty good objective feedback. Um, frankly, you know, behavior interviews are probably the hardest thing for people who are analytics, mm -hmm. right? Because you tend to want to think Mm -hmm. you tend to want to talk about the numbers, mm -hmm. and you want to see something concrete. And right. behavioral is none of those things. Right. Okay. Um, in the job search process... Uh, uh, I mean, the, the trick is sorry. look in front of a mirror and try mm -hmm. to into it. Yeah. Um, in the job search process, uh, how important do you see LinkedIn as? And what sort of details should one focus to convey through it? What's your take on a LinkedIn profile? Sorry, I missed the first half of that. Uh, so in, in oh, the, LinkedIn profile. Yeah, LinkedIn profile. Uh, LinkedIn profile is very important. Mm -hmm. um, LinkedIn profile is very important these days. Uh, we, so the interviewer is definitely going to look you up on LinkedIn. And if I don't find a LinkedIn profile, I feel very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because it feels like that's just like a, a general thing that should be happening. Mm -hmm. um, you should spend a lot of time making sure that profile fits to who you say you are. Mm -hmm. right? So if I go look at your resume and you tell me you really have enjoyed analytics and you have an analytics background, mm -hmm. but your entire you know uh, your entire background shows that you are into picking stocks and you have mm -hmm. you know three different stock picking groups, and I kind of go, okay, I don't understand like what you're looking for. Right. Um, sometimes what we do um, is say tailor our resume to basically the job and the organization that you're applying. And you might end up with three or four versions of your resume. There could be a product management version, there could be a consulting version, um, but in the sense the LinkedIn profile is generally an umbrella of all. So yep. uh, any specific feedback on that part as to how to still keep your LinkedIn profile relevant while you might be tailoring your resume? So I think that's fine, you know, that you have multiple resumes. I would say most people right now don't have that many years experience anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for profile uh, that confusing, mm -hmm. um, unless you truly have 10 and 20 years of experience to cause that confusion, mm -hmm. I think you need to spend some time like filtering things out. Mm -hmm. right? um, I, I just it's hard for me to see people typically you know going to MBA at 27, 28 to have that many years of experience in two or three different fields. Mm -hmm. Okay, and. Uh in, a, in one of our previous sessions, uh, the one topic came up was that the relevance of cover letters is slowly going down in the industry. Yeah, I haven't seen a cover letter in five years. <laughs> okay, so it's pretty much about the resume that you can get. It's about the reference you get, and then it's about the resume. Yep. So the cover letter used to be for the HR person. The HR people don't have time to read cover letters now. Hmm. So it's just... Uh, time-consuming activity that we are all engaged in while it's not required? Yes, and it, it happens online a lot too, mm -hmm. but frankly that's why you don't apply online. Okay, interesting. Well, I think I have covered pretty much all the questions that I've had and uh, any final piece of advice would you like to give to our audience? Yeah, so I, I know various people reach out to me on, on LinkedIn, um, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of alumni get reach outs from this way as well. Mm -hmm. um, my, my biggest advice for most people is, and I do this, plenty of people I know do this, if you reach out to me to connect, I will hit connect, mm -hmm. and if I don't hear from you in three days, I will also just cancel that connection. <laughs> because, you know, it, 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 A, we don't have the time to reach out to everyone who connects, but more importantly, I want to see that you care just as much about talking to me as I care about help, helping you, right? right. It's about how we're managing our own time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you should really, like, on the connection, just write out, hey, like, I am looking for X. This is why we're connecting. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, we'll call it off now. I'll uh, share your email with the attendees of the session and encourage them to reach out to you for any further questions. All right. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, Thanks. 
I absolutely wish you a good weekend and hope you enjoy your travel back and forth that you have been going through um, for the last few months. All right. I just want to go from 75 to 30.